Hello? Hi. I just called you up because, you know, nothing was happening and I wanted things to happen, so... All right. Uh, and I'm going to, Sweet. to locate some Jarvis's. He just logged on to Skype. Okay. Do you wanna you wanna add him? Or yeah, I'll have to work on how. I got him. Oh, oh you got him. Hi, Jarvis. Do you still have like middle of the highway mic? Oh no, do I? Jarvis cool. is currently piloting a helicopter. Yeah. Well, I have piloted some helicopters in my day. Uh, so I'm going to put text all over my screen, and then we can start talking about these events that happened this last weekend, because there were three of them, right? It was just the three GPs? Yeah. 300 GPs, I think, is what happened. Sounds about accurate. So why don't you guys go crazy on something for just one moment while I finish putting text on my screen, and I will join you. Okay, well I want to say congrats to David Crew, who is, god I have no idea how to pronounce his name, and Elaine on Moto, is that what it is? Yeah. Does anybody else know? Zero, zero. It's a reference to the Robert Jordan series, the Wheel of Time series of fantasy novels, if you are aware of that. I think I knew that, but that yeah. doesn't really... I don't know. I don't know how to pronounce it, but I knew that. Yeah, okay. About his name. Anyway, he won the GP down in Australia, which is good stuff. I mean, he's been one of the better Australian Magic players for a long, long time, I think. So it's about time he won one of those. Yeah, I, I don't really know anything about the Australian Magic scene, except, like, the terrible jokes that people always made. Um, and, and Gerard Wright. Like, that's, that's the extent of my knowledge about the Australian Magic. Wasn't there, like, there was some really insane wizard from Australia, like, right before I stopped? It was, uh, Tim something? I don't think he plays anymore. Tim Huff, probably. Yeah, probably. But, yeah, alright. So, yes, absolutely, we are, all of us personally familiar with the dude who won the Australian GPGP Melbourne, something like that. It was the limited GP, and yeah, he's a except dude. That, except that he played a constructed deck for the top eight. I uh, didn't I see believe the deck. format was limited. Uh, he went ahead and opened Lingering Souls, and then opened Bloodline Keeper, and this allowed him to win the GP. Oh, okay. So he took it. He took advantage of that like thing that tells you in the Wizards cover. It's like you could open Bloodline Keeper if you would like to do well in a limited GP. Yeah, he worked that one out. All right. I see. I honestly think the Geist Honored Monk is a better open in limited, especially in sealed. But I mean, no, actually, especially in draft also. Daggers <laughs> uh, users basically. Like yeah, Bloodline Keeper will, cards will are get both you clearly that. absurd. Yeah. Yeah, his deck seems good. Lingering Souls is not fair, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, <laughs> limited is fun. Like I don't, I don't really have anything else to say about that except congratulations to him. He's just a sweet dude. I'm glad he won. Yeah. Um, yeah. maybe we can get him on, like, at some point later, but yep. I don't know, I think he's at work right now, so it's unfortunately not possible for us to grab him. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, there were other GPs. I don't actually know anyone else in this top eight, I don't think. <laughs> the, um, the two other GPs were also won by standard decks, I believe. Uh, well, everyone just played Delver. Yeah, I mean there were Delvers in the other GPs. Is basically what happened. Pretty much. Um, like the Legacy deck had Delvers with slightly better cards to flip your Delvers, but it was still the same basic idea. Like they're still gonna cast Delver on turn one and then get you for three on turn two, and then you're gonna curse at them and die. So. There were some cryptic right. commands and Vidalcan Shackles involved, Antonio De Rosa won a GP. That's not, not really new territory for him, I don't think, but... Um, I don't know a ton about Modern, like, I've sort of kept my eye on the format, but... Um, I think it's certainly more Jarvis's area than mine. Huh. I didn't even see that De Rosa had won until now. <laughs> okay. I thought it was, that the it was, most... Yeah. 
Go ahead, sorry. I thought the most exciting thing from the Italian GP, which is the modern one, Torino, I think, uh, was the second place deck was Soul Sisters, which is just sort of silly. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that kind of blows my mind. Like, I was looking at the top eight decks, I didn't look at the actual bracket of how it played out, but, like, I was trying to think of how that deck ever beats, like, a Storm deck or something, and it seems like it just doesn't. Is that accurate? Like, <laughs> like it just it has sort of a mediocre aggro draw, and if the storm deck trips and has a terrible draw, then you can beat them to death. But other than that, like, there's not really a single way to interact with them in their 75. Is there? There's like, graph it's diggers. It's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jarvis. Just loses to everything. Loses to a that... opponent. Well, this, okay, this deck does not actually have Canonist or Rule of Law in its 75. Like, I am aware there are white decks that play those cards, but this one that was at the GP, it did not have those cards. Yeah, so it's a bit of a mystery. I don't know, but it um, did really well at uh, another tournament. I forgot which it was, but I was watching coverage, and Soul Sisters was doing really well. Uh, a black white. It was a black, that, was a black white murder deck that had a lot of disruption. So. Yeah, I guess that wasn't really Soul Sisters, was it? This it one's was, the, the full on white deck. Well, I mean, this deck has to murder aggro, right? Like it just it just has to get them. Not really. But like, I've never been paired if, against it with aggro and felt bad. What What do you beat if you don't beat aggro? If you have eight soul wardens in your deck? I think they probably beat Splinter Twins sometimes. That's true. Soul Warden is good against Splinter Twin. Sometimes. I mean, you still die to Pestermite unless you have two of them, but I, I don't know. This deck doesn't... It, it doesn't seem like the mightiest deck to me. Yeah. So it's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a mystery. It certainly does have four Surgical Extractions in the sideboard. What are, what are those four in Modern? Like I guess Storm. Jack points out that it has three Graph Diggers Cage and four Surgical Extractions on the board, which probably improves the Storm matchup, but I'm well, not even sure that that's enough to get you favored. You can get them if they try and go off, like if they're all in on thing, but I don't think you can actually put enough pressure on that they have a difficult time setting up. And if they have Grape Shots, like, don't they just kill you? Like, don't they just set up their hand and then grape shot you to death, and then you die? Like, the one storm list with gifts and stuff, he probably, like, you probably actually can beat that straight up with just graveyard disruption, because he only had one grape shot in his main deck. So, like, if he doesn't naturally draw to it, it's kind of hard for him to make you die without, without doing the graveyard-based shenanigans. But, like, the more standard, like, just four of everything storm deck... That just has four grape shots, right? Like, and don't they just kill you? That, that's sort of what I feel like, but maybe, I don't know, like I said, I don't know a ton of, but yeah, like this other storm deck in the top eight with four grape shots, I don't know how this deck ever loses to you. How, how hard is it to kill you after you gain, like, 15 life? I guess that's the only uh, thing that you're doing to interact with grape shot. It's not that hard to kill somebody if they're at 35 with a storm. Yeah, I don't think 35 is hard at all. Like, yeah. 60 or 70 would probably be hard, but I don't know about 35. Like, I, I don't think they can reasonably expect to just soul work out of range of rape shot. I think I saw my friend go to, like, 73 life as martyr and then die to grape shot the next turn. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure it's possible, but that, yeah. then you're up into, like, needs three grape shot type of range, so it's at least, yeah. like, something of a challenge for them to get you, I think. But it's just... Like I don't, I don't understand how this deck beats things. <laughs> what I'm saying, and and again, not an expert, so it's certainly possible that it does beat things. But it is also possible for those who are not have not been steeped in magic tradition and lore for a long time for people to just play bad decks and do well with them. Like that is a thing that happens. You can't just be like, well, it did well, so who's got the chips? Like, <laughs> doesn't doesn't actually work. Um, I mean, just look at Phil Sams. <laughs> he he wanted he wanted to be here so badly. 
Is Jarvis trolling right now? Is that what's happening? Yes, he's striking back against the Phil Sam's menace. That's what's occurring. <laughs> gotcha. Um, but yeah, I there think was... it's... Sorry, go ahead. All right, I think it's interesting to see that there are, what, six or seven or eight or possibly 16 Delver decks amongst the top eights of the two constructed events. <laughs> and it seems like every single one is a different deck except for four Delver of Secrets. Like, sure, the core is the same. You have 20 instants and sorceries, 20 lands, 20 creatures, roughly. Maybe less creatures, more instants, or what have you. But it seems like the other cards are just all different somehow. So, kind of. so what you're saying is, if you are playing Magic the Gathering, and you have four Delver of Secrets, approximately 20 lands, and approximately 20 instants in your deck, you're probably doing well. So the, the task is just to find the, the ideal configuration of the 36 non-land, non-Delver cards? I guess so. Yeah. I mean, this modern deck looks almost like Birthing Pot. It's like, it barely looks like a, a Delver deck from Standard. Yeah, I don't know. It's kind of a sweet one. Like, like it's obviously sort of a, it's more of a, a threshold deck than it is anything else really like obviously there are no cards with literal threshold in it but it has the same sort of like tiny monsters plus counter spells tempo style sort of play or it looks like it does to me it does and it's it's neat to me that modern is sort of moving in a more eternal like legacy vintage style of play than it was before, where it was just like you would look out and you'd see that, that picture of Woody from Toy Story, and at the bottom it would say, I see Trons everywhere, or something like that. Like, it was just idiots, like, slamming down Tron pieces and being like, have you met Karn? He's here on turn three. And that's really not a format which is at all attractive to me, like, if that's that's how the format looks. So I'm I'm certainly very happy that these decks are good. But it's, yeah, it is a little disconcerting that Delver of Secrets is actually everywhere, including in your nightmares. So. And your fantasies, let's say. Uh, <laughs> not be. Well, depending on who you are, I suppose. She I think even the people who get beaten by Delver, like, go to sleep and have fantasies about it. They're yeah. just... They're just sort of denying it. <laughs> you look very closely at this winner twin list that has 29 lands and 66 cards. Is it is is Jayway playing the Splinter Twin list? Is that what you're telling me? I don't know. I mean, it's it's not Jayway, but it's some mighty not, list. Not the literal Jayways. Which list is this? Sorry, I'm just scrolling. Yes, it does. Man, that must have been unreal tilting. Well, like, when you pick up your opponent's deck and you're like, how many cards is this? And they're like, oh, 66. I wanted to get the ratio exactly right. And then he just kills you on <laughs> for every game. I think it might be a, a mistype because it doesn't really make a lot of sense yeah, for his awesome. deck to have 29 lands. There was... One of these Splinter Twin lists was double splashing for Ancient Grudge and Black for, like, Inquisition and Thoughtseize. That's kind of new, right? Like, I haven't seen that before. Yeah, that's different. Oh, uh, it's this one. Huh. I mean, that's it's like okay. It's not yeah, super exciting. I, I don't actually know if it's good. It's just neat. Like I haven't seen it before. Um, I was aware of like like the thing where you're blue red and you have one breeding pool and ancient grudge in your sideboard. Like that's very standard. I've seen that before, but I haven't seen watery grave for thoughtseize plus inquisition. So that's kind of cool. You know what it is about the twin list? It pro it's not supposed to have four breeding pool, four stomping ground, which is the six extra cards. They probably just typoed. Okay, yeah, it's probably one of each. Yeah, that makes sense. Why are there so many electrostatic bolts? I don't know. Oh, it kills Spellskite. Oh, that's true. It does. And it kills, like, Delver, obviously, if you think that's a big concern. Why well, is Bribery in his sideboard? I guess just for Tron decks? Like, yeah, you take their Emrakul? But that's not even good. But who's got the chips? That's the most important question. <laughs> like, that guy didn't win, so he doesn't have the chips. I think I think you can be said to have the chips even if you're in the top eight of a GPM list. I think okay. you still have significantly more chips than your opponent. Only when it starts with at least 1,600 people or whatever this GP had, though. 
Well, I mean, the prize support doesn't actually change based on the attendance. It's kind of bonkers, but like... Which is wonderful. Yeah, there it is. So, I mean, yeah, he had to play extra rounds and it was harder, but screw him. There'll be no extra money in his coffers. We've got Faithless Looting in Alessandro Lippi's deck. It's a sweet his, card. Uh, it's a fun deck. It's good. Yeah. I, I don't know if I don't know if this is the place for it. Like as I said, I I'm not an expert on this format or really any of the decks in it. But it it certainly doesn't surprise me that it's showing up in decks that are doing well because it's a really really good card. Like it lets you see a ton of cards from your library, and when you're just looking for thing X and have thing Y, which is the situation I assume Splinter Twin is in a lot. Like that's sort of what you want to do. So. Yeah. Pretty much. Makes sense. Yep. All right. Can we talk about standard now? Because I actually have some idea what's going on there. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about standard. <laughs> um, there were like 89 Delver decks in this top eight. I think there may actually have been nine Delver decks in this top eight. That's what happened, right? There were actually or something like that. Correct? Let's see. Uh, Is there a meta game breakdown somewhere? I want to find the meta game breakdown for the entire tournament. Uh, I'm looking for it. You guys talk while I look. Okay. Well, let's see. I see one humans deck, one ramp deck, three Delver decks. There's five, five Delver decks. Okay. So five Delvers, one red green, one one red green aggro, one ramp, one humans. Yeah. Okay. I th I think that's sort of a fair assessment of the metagame right now. Um, you have five Delver decks and then three various other decks that are okay but aren't Delver decks. Like oh. I think that's that's fair. Like, none of yeah. those decks that aren't Delver are terrible, although Humans is a little baffling, but it's not awful or anything. It's just, like, why would you be playing that deck over Delver? And the answer is probably you hate Delver. Like, you just don't want to be playing it. Yeah. Like, that's what we said last week, and then it's just sort of, there are even more Delver decks in the top eight this week than there were last week, I think. <laughs> so, it's just like... Like, there are Mattel other... Mattel has Bolt of the Archangel. That's cool. Yeah, Bolt, Bolt is a totally reasonable card. Like, it's been talked about. And there are different kinds of Delver deck in this top eight. Like, there are... There were, like, two souls... That, like, Martell was playing a list that looked very similar to the list Finkel was playing when he populated the PT like two months ago with Throg School Captain and Lingering Souls and then the dude who won was playing a more like Costa-ish Delver deck that had Geist and Stalker and, and Pants and you know the Pants go on the monsters and etc cetera, etc cetera. and then there's sort of some stuff in between I think the non-Souls versions are more popular right now uh, just from what's like top eighting stuff and what I've seen on Moto and, and what have you but you can see that they sort of vary from just Geist, Stalker, Delver, and Snapcaster to the full Souls and Drog School Captain with Phantasmal Images, and then they sort of get in between to like the yu gi list with a couple a couple Dungeon Geist, and this guy who has one Phantasmal Image and one Dungeon Geist and two Stalkers, because he's not sure what he wants to be doing, and yeah. But there are a lot of Delvers. There are things that Delve. Shahar's list is just the same as Friedman's from Baltimore, actually, card for card. Sure. And I think I, the day of the Invitational, I just told Friedman to put a Barris on his main deck because you, like a lot of times in the late game, you just want something huge to play to try to dig yourself out of a hole because that can occasionally happen as Dover. Yeah, I mean, I was talking to you like two weeks ago about putting Batter Skull in my main deck, if you recall, because it's just such an absurd card against other aggressive decks. Like, you, you're in these matchups where you're like, how can I win this game? And then you, when you're post-board, you're like, oh yeah, I can get in the Baneslayer car and drive it into my opponent's face. Like, it just, it almost single-handedly beats zombies, and it's really good against all the other aggressive decks as well. So, I basically totally agree. I'm not a huge fan of Dungeon Geist in any of these decks. I mean, I tried the card myself, I think it's so incredibly clunky and, like, mediocre. 
Well, here's, well, here's a question to you, um, now that we've developed an echo for a reason. Yeah. What is Dungeon Guys... got nasty. What is Dungeon Guys good against? Like, where is no. where is the home of the Dungeon Geist? Where you're like, yeah, Dungeon Geist. It's probably good in the Spirits Mirror. Is it? What does it tap? Like a token? Because it can't it's target just tap. Bigger. It's just bigger. Okay, so it's it's really more there because it's a hill giant that goes to the skies. Uh, yeah, I every time I play the deck, I would just board it out in every single matchup. So I well, don't like. It's really good against white decks. Like, it's really good against... Oh, that's true. Like, versus another aggressive white deck, I guess you probably want to leave it in. But I don't even like it versus Costa's Delver list because really it's just way too clunky versus Mana Leak and Vapor Snag. Yeah, I, I basically agree. I think it's kind of unexciting in the Delver Mirror. You certainly don't want that thing versus a ramp deck. Right. And I don't, like, it's not exciting against control, but I think it's it's good against other, like, Stranglerood guys. Um, it's probably yeah, fine yeah. against zombies. Like, other creature decks, basically. Sure. What's wrong with the card against a ramp deck? Uh, it's very vulnerable to Sidestorm when you tap out for it. I also feel like casting it after they cast a Titan is probably not the way you are going to be winning the game. That's not ideal, but that's actually fine. Well, I mean, it's okay, but, like, if it was Primeval, you are probably just losing to the lands they got, and if it was Inferno, then they actively have to have anything, and then you die anyway. Right. But, like, you need to be killing them when they are ramp, and Dungeon Geist is not really very good at killing them, and it's not really very good at stopping them from killing you, I think. So that's sort of my assessment of, of why it is not exciting in the ramp matchup. So why are you not playing Delver right now? Um, the reason I personally am not playing Delver in Standard is because I was just playing a whole bunch of Delver, and I like playing horses, so this is more enjoyable for me. Like I, I just like to mix it up, and I think that, I think that from a viewing perspective, people enjoy it more when I take a, a little bit of a broader view of a format as opposed to just ramming the same deck for like four four weeks in a row or something yeah, like. That makes sense. It's reasonable. But, like, I was definitely delving in the MOCS, and if there was any tournament I was seriously trying to win and or do well in, I would definitely be delving still in some capacity. I would not be surprised if there are a fairly considerable percentage of games in Delver vs. Ramp where Ramp only has one huge threat and Dungeon Geists is enough. Yeah, uh, it's a function of how the deck is built. I feel like all of the ramp decks should play two Faithless Looting to just filter their cards. Because every game you want to see a certain mix of cards. Like a ramp spell, a giant thing, and probably a removal spell. Yeah, that makes quite a lot of sense. My experience was playing Velikit back when the ramp decks were Velikit, and the deck could just win off four or five cards very easily as long as they were the right four or five cards. Right. It was almost yeah. like having seven cards. It just didn't really change anything. Pretty much. I think that there's a significant difference between the current iteration of the ramp deck and Valica. Like, it is significantly less powerful and or good at killing you. But other ways, or obviously in other ways, it's pretty strictly analogous. Like, it's the same sort of shell of a deck, but it's just a lot less good at causing you to die. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Um, I wanted to ask Jarvis how you felt about the Souls Delver versus sort of Costa Delver Mirror type of, or like Pseudo Mirror. Like, if you look at the list Martel played, and then you compare it against the other sort of lists that were in the top eight that were all sort of more pants monstery, how do you think that mirror match is playing out? Uh, I feel like Martel was favored in any game where they don't get an equipment going. Okay. So, I mean, like, about at least 40% of the games he's favored in that way. He, I mean, the thing is, he only has two mana leaks to keep people, keep people honest as well, though, which right. I don't like. I guess there's that revoke existence to just hedge, but I don't well, the know. Reason, the reason I ask is that I have been sort of... I was playing 
Delver, a, a Delver list with Souls in it for the last week or so. And one of the reasons I was playing it was I felt like it had an edge in the mirror because, like, the longer the game goes, the better you just like, you just souls, and then they don't have souls, and then you win. Um, but the more mirrors I played, the more I felt like it just didn't actually play out that way. Like, you can't interact with their stalkers or their guys with equipment, and the more that the the equipment decks move towards gut shot to sort of counteract the birds decks that are becoming really popular online, the less possible it is for you to tap out for souls and ever be able to block geists. Yeah. I mean, that's certainly true, but I think you're still fine, if not ahead, versus most of the decks. They don't have an equipment every game. I mean, I think they have an equipment more than... more than enough of the time to make that matchup even-ish, is basically what I'm trying to say. Like, the huge advantage it seems like you're reaping from having souls in your deck is actually counteracted almost entirely by the disadvantage of just losing when they have pants, plus a monster that pants is good with. Right. And then you actually have to play magic against them. Hmm. And that wasn't really what I was looking for, so... I just sort of wanted to raise that point. Like, I think a lot of people are playing with souls because they're like, haha, it is for winning mirror with, with lingering souls, or maybe they're not. Maybe that's just a thing that I do. But it didn't it didn't really work out that way. And I'm sort of starting to come around back to the guys version because I think it's just better against other stuff, basically. The other thing about souls is it's not actually particularly good versus ramp or control decks because you just have to tap out and hope they don't do anything better on that turn. So it's like a really awkward card. Yes, yes, it is really miserable against control decks. And Geist is, of course, very good against control decks, so... Right. Like, that's sort of what I'm saying. If it's not... Like, if Lingering Souls isn't exciting in the matchups where you want it to be exciting, which is, like, against aggro, then I'm not sure we should even have Lingering Souls. And obviously Lingering Souls is a really good card, but like the thing where you have to tap out on turn three is so brutal against so many opponents. Yeah. I mean, I kind of like the build Tom Ma had for the FCG Open, which had four souls and four geist. Which I think is significantly different. It's just three drops. Yeah. Three drop back. So did he cut a bunch of mana leaks? No. He just has... He doesn't have Drop Spell Captains or the Phantasmal Rangers. He has three on of the Pure, though. Oh, I have a second. Second. Sorry. Can we just... Um... What was I going to say? Like, I... The reason, as a side note, people may wonder, like, why do you have to tap out on turn three? The reason that you, like, you don't have to tap out on turn three. But if you don't tap out on turn three, like, if your plan is to wait until turn five when you can cast souls with mana leak up, like, that's a really, really slow clock, and you're not going to get to five lands that reliably. Like, you're just going to brick off on your fifth land drop or your fourth land drop or whatever, and you're going to end up with all these three drops stuck in your hand. Yeah, that's pretty accurate about what happens. I think one of the really cool things about playing a deck with Delver, and one of the reasons that Delver is doing so well on every format, is that when you have powerful one-drops, you just remove mana screw from the equation a huge amount. Um, it's just so much easier to play your spells and do your game plan and not worry about drawing the exact right amount of lands. And as the curve gets higher, I think that that's adding a lot of inconsistency to the deck. And I also think that the same thing is true for putting something like Invisible Stalker and Pants in your deck. I think you're raising your curve and you're putting in cards that do very little in a lot of draws. So I think were I to start at a place with Delver, I would be playing a deck which had, you know, neither pants nor an abundance of three drops, I would sort of be sticking to the traditional 
fish model of the low casting cost threats plus disruption. So you would just, just go back to like Phantasmal Bear or whatever? I don't know about Phantasmal Bear, but I would... Um, let me see if... See if I can find a good example in the top eight. Yeah, I don't know. Like, the basic problem, and, and it is something of a problem, is that there aren't cards that cost less than three that don't suck, basically, <laughs> other than Delver right. and, like, Snapcaster, and Snapcaster is not really an aggressive monster. Um, like, I mean, yeah. I guess I would just try to minimize how high you were getting your curve and how um, situational your threats were. And maybe what we're seeing is that there's no way to really minimize that fully, given the cards in the format right now, and so we're getting people choosing to weaken their deck in different ways, but it, they're just sort of equivalently weakening. There isn't one right way to fill in the last ten cards or whatever. How do you feel about Sword of War and Peace versus Lingering Souls Delver, just as a side note? As a non-Delver deck. Like, as a deck that cannot fight the Mana Leak War. We don't know. We have no yeah, feeling. I don't know. I sort of think Garrick might be okay. I think I'd rather have Garrick than a sword. I... sure. I don't really want either of those things, to be quite honest. <laughs> okay, well, if we're already at 60 cards, I wouldn't... Wouldn't yeah. worry about it. But I think Garrick would be going in before the sword did. I mean, the problems with Garrick are that A, he kind of sucks against, against multiple threats, and B, he really sucks with Thalia. And he also sucks against Mana Leak, obviously, but... Eh. <laughs> Doesn't your entire deck suck against Mana Leak, though? Um... Fair. Well... I mean, these cards do if we don't have elves. If we have elves, then none of our cards do. I don't think we can keep this hand. Sure. Gonna smash. We're going to try and smash. I don't know. We'll see. Alright. Was there anything else from the weekend that needed to get talked about? Uh, I don't know. Was there any anything other than the three GPs? Like, the limited GP sort of is what it is. And, like, it's sweet that we knew the dude who won. But beyond that, it was a limited GP. Bloodline Keeper is a good card. You guys should open it. <laughs> um... The standard one, we talked about Delver somewhat, and then there were some other Delver... Oh, I, I just sort of wanted to touch on, like, blue-white horses, since that's something that I have a fairly large amount of experience with. Like, I don't think it's a terrible deck, or, or whatever, like, it's it's fine, but... That's gross. But, um, I do not think it is favored against Delver. Like, I think your Delver matchup is not especially good. So, it's weird to, and also your RAM matchup is like, not, it's really bad. <laughs> so, it's weird to me that people would decide to use that deck now. But, you know, people play what they want and don't really care about what you have to say. <laughs> people do what they want. Yeah, do what I want. <laughs> but that's like, like as, as someone who is an avowed horse fan, that's not really where I would be putting my horses at this moment in time. Actually, the guy who had who won MOCS had kind of an interesting list. Who, he maxed Kaplan? out on uh, Goobafish. Yeah, this is David Kaplan. Yeah, he maxed out on Stalkers and Sword of War and Peace. Yeah, he just he went the full like I do not wish to interact with you package of Magic the Gathering cards. He was like yeah. I would like to cast this on turn two and this on turn three, and then I don't care what you do because you're dead. Like. <laughs> That is the thing which was occurring. Yeah, it's kind of kind of interesting. Yeah, it's it's a 
a new direction that DEX could possibly go. I don't know if I would want my DEX to go in that direction, but it's certainly a thing. I'm assuming he tested a bunch to figure out that that plan was actually good, but who knows? Uh, it's possible. Like, that would not be my default assumption, but it is possible. It seems like if you're going to go with situational weak cards and equipment, it could only be better if you have, you know, more of each. Like, you wouldn't play a Splinter Twin deck with two Deceiver Exarch and to Splinter Twin. Yeah, I mean, certainly he's a lot better at beating people with Stalker and Sword of War and Peace. Um, the question is, the, the obvious question that it begs is just how many games do you lose to drawing one of those and not the other? And I, I don't actually know the answer to that. Shall we field questions from the chat? Uh, that's a thing we can do, sure. David Kaplan has an article explaining his deck. I don't think we want to read an entire article right now, though. We'll just never know what it means. <laughs> um, block is a different format since the last time I made block videos. I don't know. I think I'll make some cube drafting videos, though. Oh, baby. I'm excited oh, for that. We should talk about the cube. Because uh, the cube is like the most colossal failure of a really sweet thing that I've ever seen. They announced Moto Cube, and then they didn't let you customize your cube, and they're only letting us play it for three days or something. It, also, I don't understand. Sure with eight of your friends. I, I just have no idea. <laughs> Do they not understand what a cube is? <laughs> Evidently. You, you seem displeased by this. Well, I'm going to do it. I'm going to draft it. It's going to be fun. But Jesus Christ, come on. There are, okay, Magic, there's a huge amount of community support for making magic an awesome thing. We see that in cube drafts and like custom sets that people make from nothing and all this stuff. And then we go to Moto and they're like, they need to let the community make Moto awesome. And what they've done is given us the exact cube that they want us to play and only let us do it for three days and we can't do it with our friends. So way to go, wizards. Way to go. They're trying, I guess, but... Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm inclined sort of towards the the opposite. <laughs> my Delver opponent is complaining about my draws. When I'm, like, clearly dead on board. <laughs> like, so lucky that you could die slightly slower. Anyway, um... Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm sort of inclined the opposite way. Like, as someone who has who has lived through the Moto Wars, as it, as it were, and, like played Moto for a long time, my expectations are just so low that, like, when they do anything, I'm like, yeah, things happening! Like, like when I when I join a game of Magic on Magic Online, or, like, open a replay on Magic Online, and then it works like it's supposed to, I'm really happy. So, that's, like, the level of confidence that I go into it expecting. And the fact that they're giving me a cube draft like for three days, that's so far above like all the other things that they're doing that I'm like, yes, for a brief period I will be less angry. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's sort of how I feel. Like, I agree that the reason I cube draft and like the most stuff I get out of cube drafting is not really being, being utilized here and like it could be implemented in a better way. But, like, we all have our horror stories, and this is just so much better than those stories that, like, you know, I'm, I'm pretty happy about it. Well, we haven't seen it actually function yet either, so I That's wouldn't, true. you know, count your chickens before they're hatched or whatever. 
whatever it is. Now I need to decide how I'm going to die on board here. You should probably be a little concerned about a bullet hole in your wall, yeah. That's, that's concerning to me. I mean, the quest, I would be more concerned if there was a bullet hole, but I didn't know where it came from. I was like, well, yeah, a bullet, but which kind? Like, which kind? Was it when the neighbors were shooting through the walls? Was it when the gangs were fighting outside our door? Like, there are so many options. Like, if there was a bullet hole in my wall, I would know when that happened. It was when I had drunken magic players, and they shot off all their firearms that they normally have. This is the only way I'm winning this game. How long until magic has guns in it? It's going to be <laughs> exciting. They, like, did an entire... Okay, not even one. They've done several entire robotic future sets. And there's never been anything with a gun. So be like be conceptual. Fodder cannon. <laughs> fodder cannon is an awfully big gun. That's clearly a cannon, which is not actually a gun. Cannons are things yeah. that humans had. We have to address the fact that even in the future, future, just in case anyone thinks that I actually think that the Romans had cannons. But the Romans totally had cannons. <laughs> Absolutely. And you should be able to poop on people's kitchen floors. That's that's what I say. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Go, go on. Go I on don't about remember what I was saying. Engines. There's a portal card with a gun that's amazing. Is that like one of the horsemanship? Cards. Does it have horsemanship? Can it be blocked by creatures that are not trained in horsemanship? It still loses to a tank, even even when mounted with a weapon. How does he have so many uh, things, Adam? This doesn't seem uh, good for you. He has 75% of a souls and 100% of a time. It's actually not so. Bad. So that's two cards over there that you're losing. <laughs> yeah, it is two Sweet. cards that generated approximately 900. It's interesting how this deck mirrors the blue white flyers decks in limited. Over. Where like. I assume Delver they're does. just they're just trying to kill you in the air before you kill them on the ground. Yeah, the thing where this you really looks like a limited matchup, Adam. The thing where you saying. to interact in games of magic, and you're just like, how about if I hit you and you can't block for the whole game, and then you die before you can kill me, <laughs> and we will never do combat. No but it always there. seems like the deck that attacks on the ground should win, because they don't have to pay extra for their creatures to have flying. And the flying deck isn't blocking ever anyway. But then the flying deck always wins. And it really makes my green monsters sad. How do you feel about horsemanship? <laughs> like... <laughs> the horsemanship decks unlimited? Yeah. yeah. The, the yeah. green-white horsemanship yeah. archetype? Yeah. Like, if you saw a horse first pick overall, would you move in on it? Horses are good. I probably would. I'm strongly in favor of horses. We know. Are there any horsemanships in the cube? Yes, uh, there are. There's that thieving magpie with horsemanship, and I think oh, they have horsemanship yeah. manowar as well. Let's go look. Yep, there's definitely a fishing scholar general. Is it, can you just describe it by what it does? Like, can it be horsemanship thieving magpie or horsemanship manowar? Like, as opposed to Chinese name, the man who I have no idea what it does. There's no. They don't have the uh, manowar. He they have a lot of manowar. Company. They just have regular manowar. Okay.
What do you think the best overall first pick in this cube is? Um, the one that require me to have read the cards. The one that wins you the most matches of Magic: The Gathering. Okay, like, but what do you think that is? That's what I'm asking. I'm asking you to clarify the question. Like, is that what you mean by best? Because a lot of the time in Q yes. drafts, which I take in general less seriously than other drafts, I'm first picking like silly cards because I want to like <laughs> I will first pick me some time spirals because I love time spirals. But that card is not good. <laughs> But, like, well, if like, you're talking about this perspective, yeah, I think, I think like, um, really, really hot hallmark aggro carpets, like, like Bit Blossom slash Sulfur Vortex, like, like generally, generally, the best the cards in aggro decks are the ones that aren't creepers and come down and completely murder people while being, like, artifacts or enchantments. So, sort of, like, Winter or Bitter Blossom, Sulfur Vortex, like, that sort of thing. Okay. So What's do you the like best a color going to be? Uh, being a match, it's probably red. Like, people are... Blue is going to be overdrafted because everybody opens the blue cards and they're like, these cards are absurd! And they take all the five drops, but if you just take the one and two drop, they're Yeah, that sounds accurate. As someone who is cooped with a lot of different people, and a lot of different cubes, a lot of varied skill levels, that's what's going to happen. People are overdraft blue and underdraft aggro, and then aggro decks are going to win. Why is Dream Halls in this cube? Uh, Dream Hall is in this cube because they have like 20, 30 cards that are complete bricks and don't do anything. Yeah, like, because they want to include like combo cards. And those are like Dream Halls, Tendrils of Agony, the Mind's Desire, and then there's... There's Mind's Desire in this cube? Yeah. Yeah, but it's not good. Oh, wow. And there's, like, a Heartbeat of Spray. Really, Jarvis? It's not good. There's no Early Jarvis. Like, it's just... They didn't put in the tools for those decks to exist, but they put in the engines because they wanted people to try and fail and then feel bad about themselves. So... I don't really know what to tell you. I think white's gonna be the best color because because white is better than red. Why oh, not? it's really good. Like, <laughs> it's funny because the person who designed this cube, like, largely, I think, and there was someone else working on it. I don't know that, but but Tom LaFell and I talked a lot about cube design. Like, we had a fairly extensive conversation about how you design cubes and like what you wanted, and what you didn't want, and we did a rotisserie at GP Pittsburgh, and we're both agreed that the best deck in his cube at the time by a fairly wide margin was white-red aggro. It was like tiny, evasive monsters that just punched you to death, like Soltari Priest, like Jack Pup type of stuff, and then you just kill them with wind spells. And I don't know if that's changed, because I haven't done a ton of really serious cubing with like really players then, but I suspect it's largely this. Yep. yep. There's no Tallow West. <laughs> There's no Armadillo Cloak either, which is sad news for the Slurches of the world. <laughs> Poor Slurch. I mean, he did, the, the rotisserie we did in Fishburg started with Slurch first, pitching, first picking Armadillo Cloak. Like, that was... <laughs> All right, cool. All right. Well, I'm looking forward to cube. Yep. yep. I am. And I will be doing will be some sort of, like, best of cubing. cubing. I don't know Perfect. what exactly I'll be doing, but it will involve a lot of drafting in cube. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, so I think, I think that about it, it but thank you guys for coming on. on. Um, you can you follow can them on Twitter if you guys want. want. Very powerful. Very powerful. They know all of them. And playing the Magic yeah. Gathering, so I'm sure they will say anything. Things. So that is a that thing is you do too. if you like fair viewers, but I cannot tolerate my voice coming through the Skype call anymore. So I think we're gonna. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Adam. All right. Thanks.
Thanks for stopping.